He knows more than you can imagine. At last. Welcome, Neo. As you no doubt have guessed, I am Morpheus. It's an honor to meet you. No. The honor is mine. Please, come. Sit. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole, hmm? You could say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Blue pill, red pill. Bondage or freedom? Which? This iconic scene from The Matrix, a movie from 1999, exactly lays out the same choice that Emily Cady, who was an early New Thought pioneer, lays out in the first chapter of Lessons in Truth. Bondage or freedom? 
which and it exactly illustrates in a more modern format the exact choice that she described it is fascinating the way that the makers of the matrix put that scene together and the story that they told in order to get that concept across if you're not familiar with the matrix it essentially is a dystopian future world in which machines have taken over and human beings are held in small capsules they are plugged into a matrix which allows them to believe that they are living what we would call normal lives but they are actually being held captive and their bodies are being farmed for the electricity that runs the machines the world that they live in appears to be reality they can see touch smell taste feel and yet it is not and the choice that Morpheus played by Lawrence Fishburne is offering to Neo who is Keanu Reeves is that choice to remain a captive remain in thrall or to be awakened to the real reality and to be able to see past the illusions to what actually is it is interesting to me that they do it in a scene that is eerily reminiscent of John the baptizer and Jesus those are essentially their roles in the plot Neo is a Christ figure and he is determined to be the one who will lead the people out of bondage Morpheus is his teacher and the one who initiates him down to the water in the notice the glass of water in the scene that stood between them um, and even after Neo in the matrix drinks the water with the red pill his actual body in, a, in the scene that follows is ejected from the pod that the machines were keeping it in because he has awakened and it flows down a long chute into a, a huge like an underground lake so he is literally baptized this imagery is used on purpose and it helps us to understand the awakening consciousness and what it really means to us for each of us we have this choice to remain asleep as Morpheus said to you'll wake up in your bed and it'll be as if nothing happened you'll go on as if before but another thing he says in that scene that I think probably resonates with many of us in this sanctuary today is I know why you're here there's been something that has been bothering you there's perhaps a like a splinter in your consciousness something that just wouldn't go away the the feeling that somehow something just wasn't right I know for me growing up in the religious tradition I grew up in there was something that just never made sense to me something that just wasn't quite right and for a long time I was willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater I was I was willing to just say well you know this idea of God and this idea of Jesus that these people are trying to get me to go along with since it's not working for me that must mean that you know there's no real God or if there is it doesn't have anything to do with me and you know who knows about that Jesus guy I don't believe in him at all but the thing is is there was something larger behind that sort of illusionary version of the universe that they were trying to sell me and once I took my red pill 
and began the search for the truth, I found a Jesus that made sense to me. I found a God that I could at least begin to understand and and have a day-to-day relationship with. Any of us who are completely happy with a status quo, right? Any of us who are completely happy with the idea of simply believing in something and being saved are probably not going to want to do the work that Emily Cady describes in Lessons in Truth. This is not a way of simple answers. You know, if it was, Morpheus could have just given Neo a pill and he'd be fine. That'd be it. Game over. End of the movie. End of the story. But it was not. As Morpheus said, this this matrix we live in, this, this reality, this world, is really an illusion that is designed to keep our minds in prison. What Emily talks about in this book, in the first chapter in particular, is the dichotomy between what we perceive to be this world of the senses and the world of the spirit that lies behind it. we are living in these meat suits that are taught to depend upon their senses. The things that we can touch, the things that we can smell, see, hear, taste, count. The scientific method that can allow us to reproduce things so we're fairly confident we know things. And yet there is so much beyond that which is visible. When I was learning the electromagnetic spectrum as an electronics warfare officer, they had up on the wall a big chart that showed the electromagnetic spectrum from you know the very lowest frequencies to the very highest. And visible light was only a tiny portion of the spectrum. I think about how many things there are in this sanctuary right now that we simply cannot see because they lie outside that spectrum. And even within that, we each have a different perspective And it's not just from the position we're all sitting or standing in. We're each informed by our history. We are each unique. Some of us may be colorblind. Women have one extra rod in their eyes. They can see differently than men do. This seemingly solid object is actually made up of energy. So am I. So are you. So are we all. Every solid appearing thing is actually energy. Some of us may have heard of the concept of a photonic universe. There is a relationship in that energy beyond that which we are currently able to see. And the idea that there is something behind this matrix, some spirit world, is essentially the basis of the work that we do. In unity, we understand that the foundation of the universe, spirit, God, whatever name we need to know that by, the force, it lives as us, breathes as us, it 
moves through this time and space as us. It comes to know itself as us. When we become completely mired down in the experience of the physical reality, we become prisoners. when we think that the only reality is that that we can see and touch and taste and move around we are held in thrall we fail to break out of the matrix and see that we are being held captive by our perceptions of this reality when there is a greater reality that lies beyond. Our brother in Wayshower Jesus, uh, the, the, the man who was our Neo, taught us that we are children of God, children of spirit. And his apostle Paul went on to say that We are not only children, but if we are children, then we are heirs to Spirit and God. And what that means to each of us is that we inherit this power that God wisdom, God life, God love, God compassion are all part of what we can hold on to when we reach within instead of reaching without. Emily Cady talks about what it takes for us to begin to claim our inheritance. And one of the first things that she does is describe how important it is for us to come in touch with spirit within. It was interesting to me that today's daily word lined up so well with this lesson because what it's teaching us is that divine expression that we are is always grounded in truth. What Emily talks about is that there is no progress possible at the level of spirit without meditation. She says daily, and while I would agree with her, I don't want to scare any of you who are not already meditating off. But it is meditative practice which begins that journey. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that meditation can be different for each of us. We were talking about that in adult spiritual education this morning. Meditation can be, you know, the sort of classic, I'm going to sit in the silence and maybe say om. Um, We can have guided meditations, as I've talked about several times before. I use the uh, Insight Meditation Timer app on my phone and on my tablet. I think I'm up to about 900 sessions on, through my timer now. It'll be, I'll, I'll have myself a little party when I hit a thousand, I think. But what it allows me to do is to program particular meditative practices when I may feel a need for something, whether it is forgiveness or peace from anger, whatever it might be. And then when I'm ready to simply spend time in silence, it also allows me to spend time in silence or maybe with a little nature sound. Uh, It's very helpful for going to sleep if I need some help going to sleep at times. But for some people, there are other activities that are better for meditation. And even though they may not look meditative, they are. We talked about having a walking meditation. Running can be a meditative activity. We even talked about fishing. You know, most of those guys out around the lake that uh, Laura and I run around who are 
throwing a, a line in the water probably don't think of themselves as going to meditate. But for quite a lot of them, that's exactly what they're doing as they stand there with their pole and their line in the water and nothing else going on but the lake. The thing about this is, as she describes, it's, it's not something that we can use to be a quick means to an end. This is not a quick fix. It's not you take a pill and you're done. You take the pill and the work begins as it does in the matrix. It's about a way of life. It's about making a change to our daily routine that begins to open our eyes to that world it is very easy to become distracted because we do have to live in this world. We have to work in this world. We have to reach out to each other in this world. It wouldn't have done the people in the movie any good if Neo had simply become the one and then said, yeah, you know what, I'm going to stay out of the Matrix. I'm not going back in there. You know, it's, it's all false and there's dangerous guys in there. I'm not going in. He had to come into the real world and then go back in and do what had to be done. Emily Cady talks similarly about us and saying, that, yeah, med you know, you got to meditate and meditation is great and it's good for you and you know, don't just become somebody that sits on a rock on a mountaintop and meditates all the time because that's not going to do anybody any good. And she points out that uh, Jesus, our, our brother, would go away daily and spend time in prayer and meditation, but then he'd come back and he'd be all charged up and he would be able to do the things that are described in the stories about him. Go away and get prayed up and come back and heal someone. Go away and get prayed up and come back and drive out some demons go away and get prayed up and come back and do all those things that seem miraculous. I know that there are things that each and every one of you does that are miraculous. Jesus said, greater things than I have done ye shall do. And we do those things. Sometimes they're a very small part of this existence that we live in this matrix that lies all around us and by making a practice of returning to spirit and spending time with spirit we have a better chance of repeating those miraculous things and doing things that are far beyond what we ever thought we could do it's interesting that the other big practice that she mentions in this first chapter as we begin this study of this is what we have been studying for the past month and a half, and that's forgiveness. And she points out that if you are stuck on something, that it's very possible that why you're stuck in attempting to manifest or in doing the work that you wish to do, it may very well be that there is an unforgiveness blocking you. And in her words, the idea behind forgiving is giving good for evil. That even when someone has done something horrible, that we can push past the illusion, get to the truth by returning that with good. because it is a demonstration of our understanding that God is in all things. She cites the example of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph, the biblical character, who was sold into slavery by his brothers because he was their father's favorite. And then after a famine, his family heads to Egypt. And in the meantime, Joseph has been 
promoted and promoted until he's essentially the advisor to the king of Egypt. And when his brothers come to Egypt and they are ready to be slaves and they beg for food, there's Joseph, the guy they almost killed but sold into slavery. And he forgives them by saying that you know, they meant it for ill, but God meant it for good. When we are able to do that, we can see past these appearances and into the truth that God is, in fact, behind all. We each get to make choices, but maybe the most important choice that we have is between the red pill and the blue pill. Are we only going to believe in that which is in front of us? Are we willing to just keep going about life without looking for what's behind? Or do we really want to see how deep that rabbit hole goes? Do we want to explore the realm of spirit and begin to learn those lessons in the truth that there is more to this than meets the eye and there is more to us than these animals we ride around in. As we go through the next several weeks, we're going to be taking a deeper look at lessons in truth and some of the foundational teachings of unity and new thought. But for this week, I'm just going to ask you to ponder that one question. Red pill or blue pill? Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Oh, thank you. Sweet Spirit, we open our eyes to see that which has been hidden behind what seems real, knowing that you are there, that you are not only beyond the deepest star in space, but deep within us, behind our deepest dream, our greatest desire, and that we are living expressions of you. For this knowledge of the truth that lies behind all the illusions, and for what it means to us as your children and your heirs, we say thank you. Thank you, God. So it is.